Welcome to the Mobile Workforce Podcast, where we sit down and have real conversations with business leaders that have been where you are. During these interviews, we'll dive into what it takes to improve systems and champion processes that maximize performance. Each week, our trailblazing guests share their experiences and understanding of the workforce to help inspire change, challenge our thinking, and share what it takes to successfully travel the road to profitability. Now here's our host, co-founder and chief evangelist of About Time and WorkMax, Mike Merrill. Hello and welcome to the Mobile Workforce Podcast. I am your host, Mike Merrill, and today we are sitting down with Darcy Borio, the president of DAB Partners and the co-host of the Enterprise Software Podcast. Darcy has nearly 25 years of experience in on-site technology and implementations. So we are very excited to have you on the podcast today. Thank you for joining us, Darcy. Mike, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for asking me to come and it's great to see you. Yeah, we've kind of had some of our events that we used to see each other at shut down this last year. Yeah, just a bit. The only time I see you is in your when you're out running on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> well, I try and do that as much as I can. So I, you're I amazing. You post some of your running running pics too. Yeah, I need to do more of them. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Well, I'll post more and I'll and I'll watch for you too. So well, before we dig, dig into the conversation today, can you give our listeners just a little bit of your background and experience? Sure. So I started um, my software career in uh, at Timberline Software about uh, mid-90s and uh, worked in the Beaverton, Oregon headquarters for the next 10 years or so. I started in support and over the course of the 10 years, I always joke that I worked on every segment of every floor in the building because I went from support I did consulting, then I moved upstairs and I was in QA for three years, believe it or not, and uh, (laughs) then moved to sales and marketing. So I worked kind of in all facets of that business before uh, joining Alliance Solutions Group as one of the original employees, a uh, then Timberline, uh, well, Sage Construction and Real Estate or um, many iterations of that over the years, uh, reseller. Um, Around 2012, I... uh, decided to exit the construction business because I couldn't hang with the economy. Um, So I went and worked for Avalara uh, cloud-based sales tax automation software, and then um, did a couple of years with some different ISVs. And in uh, 2017, along the way, somewhere along the way, I started co-hosting a podcast, Enterprise Software Podcast. I've been doing that for about six years and really has just have discovered my passion for all things ERP software uh, and then I uh, started my own business, Dab Partners, in 2017, where I consult with uh, software publishers to help them grow their um, partner channels and referral networks. Wow. That's a, <laughs> a long and illustrious career. So, And you're not done yet, right? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> your, your husband says no, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, so Darcy's husband, Tim, also works for Alliance Solutions still. So I run into him quite a bit as well. And he's, he's another, another great <laughs> friend in the industry. So uh, you mentioned something there. You, you use the word ERP. Can you just explain what that stands for for those listeners that maybe don't or aren't familiar with that? Absolutely. Enterprise resource planning software. And, uh, you know, it's not a term that we've used in, I would say, in the construction industry. When I was around the construction industry, we just called it, you know, we call it construction accounting software. We called it um, even maybe construction financial and operations software, but ERP really implies, you know, you'll get different answers from different people. But to me, it's it's really, it's not just saying, okay, we're just doing accounting and then we're going to do something else over here and something else over here and all these disparate solutions. It's saying, we're going to find a product or products that work together that cover our entire enterprise. And so, you know, we used to kind of leave it to the realm of manufacturers and distribution. We didn't really talk about it in terms of construction um, until fairly, you know, recent years. But um, really, it's for a construction company, you know, we'd, we'd want it something that's going to cover their, um, obviously, their job cost accounting, their estimating, their project management, maybe service management, and have it all be integrated together um, seamlessly, rather than having a bunch of different products for each of those things. So, I would say that's kind of the big difference of what an ERP is today in the construction world. Yeah, versus just an old accounting and payroll system. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, 
that's a lot of areas of the business that a system like that touches. So I, I, um, I imagine with mobility being such a big piece of today's ecosystem, that that's just a whole other dynamic. How have you seen that play into the ERP space at this point? I mean, it's it's huge and it really expands out, you know, the ability to have a true ERP environment because you're not having you're you're able to put integrated tools in the hands of people that aren't sitting in the in the office connected to the server. And so it just makes it that much easier to accomplish that goal of, you know, keeping everyone on the same system and all in sync and together in ERP. And, you know, mobile is a it's such a crucial part of ERP. You can't I mean you can't have an ERP or an ERP add-on solution without some sort of mobility component, especially today, obviously. So yeah, and the mobile, I guess, I guess, essentially would be an apps or some type of collection to feed that ERP. Is that is that kind of how you're seeing it utilized? Um, typically, yeah. I mean, there's there's different variations, but uh, mobile kind of implies also just general mobility. So. I mean, it is apps, it is handhelds and tablets and devices like that, but, you know, it's also being able to work from anywhere, um, especially obviously today, that's mobility too. Um, so it's all part of yeah. mobility. Uh, back in the, back in, oh gosh, it was, I think 2005, I used to um, sell this product called Field to Base. Have you ever heard of it? I don't know if it's still around or not, but I would go out to meet with contractors with this big tablet. I mean, they were so heavy and huge, but they were tablet PCs and like nobody really knew about tablet PCs back then, but they were like, you know, in these ruggedized cases and we'd go out and be like, look, you can go out on the job site and you can take a picture and write on it and then send it back into the office. And everyone was like, oh, wow. And these things were they were two thousand dollars for the hardware alone um and then the monthly after that we actually just ran across one the other day we were cleaning out some closets and found an old one that we had sitting around the house and we were laughing about it because it was so long ago it's come such a long way so i mean that back then was you know people had you know sometimes they would have a laptop on the job site often they would not have internet on the job site it would maybe have a fax line on the job site. So we've just come so far in just, you know, maybe 10 years, right? Or whatever. Yeah, I remember running into Field to Base back then. They were, again, kind of ahead of their time for sure. They definitely, uh, they they were onto something. I think it was just a little ahead of the curve. We were using the Palm Pilots to collect data. And we thought, wow, how cool that would be to have the whole computer and a tablet and and all that in, in one solution. But uh Obviously, it was probably a little bit too far of a gap to bridge early in those days. I think it was. Um, you know, it was interesting because we had a lot of really quick early adopters that were just like, yes, but those were like the bleeding edge people. And then it just mm -hmm. tapered off and like it was really hard to get adoption. I remember the first time I saw your product was at, um, I think it was either a, it was either a Southeast Builders Conference or the International Builders Show. And mm -hmm. I was like, wow, that's so cool. And I can't even remember what kind of device it was on. Maybe it was a Palm Pilot, but it was so cool because it was just, somebody showed it to me. It was it was a time um, entry and it was basically clocking in and clocking out, I think. is that and, and it was just so simple. It had big buttons and you just go, I'm in, I'm out. And it was like, wow, that's so different from having to buy a $2,000 tablet and then, you know, have one person holds the tablet and everyone else comes and checks in on it and everything. So it was, uh, you know, pretty revolutionary what you guys had already back then in the mid 2000s, I think it was, or something when I first saw it. Yeah, that sounds about right. And that's, yeah, I think it was the International Builder Show in Florida, if I remember right. So, I, um, and I think, was Field to Base out of North Carolina? Is that what I'm remembering? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, they, so again, going back, we, we've we come so far in actually a short period of time, really. I, we're talking like a decade or so, like you were mentioning, yeah. maybe a decade and a half. Um, and I, I know when I, so I was a general contractor and when I was, you know, in my early and mid twenties and kind of growing up in the industry, so to speak, I know accounting was almost a swear word, at, you know, <laughs> uh, back at that time. It was, it was like a necessary evil, like paying your taxes, like you had to do it, but you didn't really <laughs> like it. What's changed? Is it the same? And, and why is that perspective out there, do you think? Um, you know, I think for one, you know, maybe there's a perception that you need to understand accounting to use an accounting software. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> you don't need to do a T account or debits and credits or things like that. I mean, there's a, that's all in play, but that's kind of behind the scenes. Assuming that you get it all set up right, then, um, you know, a modern accounting software, ERP software, um, you know, kind of does it for you. You don't have to sit there and every time you make a transaction, enter in what GL account is going to and all that kind of stuff if you set it up properly based on your rules. So, um, you know, it's, it's it can be actually very beneficial because it's not just um, invoices, pay, a, AP and AR, you've got now your job data in there and that's all incorporated in and you can get important reports out of it. So it's very valuable. It's not just this little thing that should be set over on the shelf alone to pay your bills and bill your customers. Yeah. And I love, uh, I love what you said earlier about the mobility, because that that's something I think is a great reminder for everybody. Mobility doesn't just mean smartphones and tablets and apps, but it, it, the ability to work remotely, even like you're saying, Darcy, even on the accounting level, have that data out there at your fingertips on the job. Yeah, I remember when I was selling um, Timberline and it was a, you know, it was an on-premises software. There wasn't any cloud options for it. And then there'd be these other cloud products out there and they'd go, and this was, you know, years ago. Um, so people come to me and go, is your software in the cloud? And I'd say, is that important to you? And they'd go, yeah, that's really important. And I'd say, why? And they're like, uh, like they didn't even know what it meant, but they just knew that they were supposed to be in the cloud. And so, <laughs> but the argument was that, well, I mean, does accounting really need access from the field? I mean, they're in the office. Where are they going? That was kind of the, the thing back then. Obviously, today, we know that's not the case because, number one, accounting this past year hasn't been in the office. But number two, um, you know. No, it hasn't. <laughs> but, you know, secondarily, I mean, I live in Florida and, um, you know, sometimes we have hurricanes coming and people have to go. And if they've got their server in their office, they got to go wrap it up and put it on high ground and pray for the best. Um, you know, if their server's damaged, then no one can work. If their server, if their power's out at the office and they're all relying on connecting to that on-premises server, even if they have figured out how to connect it remotely, securely, um, they still may not be able to access it if there's no power or the server's been damaged. So that's just one of the reasons why, you know, I mean, I, back then, you know, we didn't think of all those things and cloud wasn't as accessible as it is now. But today it's like, OK, yeah, you need to be in the cloud, even accounting. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, and your challenge in Florida, definitely. I mean, that's unique. I'm in Utah. We don't have hurricanes here. So that's not, you know, maybe like uh, earthquakes or avalanches, but uh, yeah, different challenge. <laughs> But it is interesting that a server is so critical for those that have their business hosted on it. I mean, what a risk to have that in one location that maybe isn't so secure. Mm -hmm. So so tell me, with, with cloud-based accounting systems or options now, that the job site has visibility into the same data that the office does, what has that done in your perspective for efficiency of just construction or even industries in general that that utilize these types of technologies. I mean, it's it's the real time data and it's the real time bi directional data, right? So, um, you know, when something's happening on the job, there's technology like what you guys do that it makes it so easy for someone on the job to, you know, they don't have to dig into some software and get it on a laptop at the end of the day and and go enter a bunch of information and then, you know, maybe print a report or whatever. And then someone else back at the office enters it in manually. Um, and so the, the office gets access to that information much more quickly for whatever they may need it for, for their accounting purposes. And um, likewise, possibly more importantly, the field gets access to the data from accounting without having to wait until, oh, that invoice hasn't been entered yet, or that invoice got entered, but I'm not sending you a report until tomorrow. And, you know, it's right there immediately in real time. And, and ideally, even um, with abilities to um, analyze the data, drill down into the data, slice and dice, do what if scenarios with the data right there in the field, and um, to really know about any risks that you have on the job as far as budget or schedule issues that may be arising. So you just know that much faster and are able to react in time to mitigate the problem. Yeah, that's a great point too. And I, I mean, I know I still hear this commonly if, if companies aren't getting their invoices out quick enough 
you know, maybe the jobs closed out or maybe they're now they're hitting another draw cycle. So not only speed of making decisions, but just getting paid and ensuring that you are getting paid. Sometimes companies don't get paid. And if, if the, the budget runs over and there are challenges with ownership or whoever, the bank, whatever, doesn't really matter. Uh, if you're if you're last in line to get paid, sometimes, you know, if you do get paid, it, it might be pretty late. All these things can make or break a job very easily. So, you know, underbilling can do that and, you know, off schedule can do that. So there's a really lot of things to keep an eye on that, um, you know, in the past, I mean, I've seen people getting faxes with the stack of papers. I mean, granted, I'm, you know, aging myself a little bit on that, but I still think there's some of you guys out there that are doing that, that are not, maybe not faxing, but there's still a lot of paper being transmitted around, reporting being transmitted around that we got to sift through and everything. Um, and it's, it's yesterday's data because somebody ran the reports this morning or whatever. So, you know, real time information is so much more accessible and so important. Yeah. So you, you mentioned, uh, cloud-based and that was the buzzword or the question, the checkbox that somebody <laughs> they should be you know, checking off to, in order to be innovative. But what's the difference between cloud-based systems and cloud hosted? <clears throat> um, typically hosted is really just going to be your software only it's on someone else's server. Um, well, it's all on someone else's server, but um, someone else has a physical server for you or a virtual server somewhere and they manage it instead of you managing it. So, and typically those are, those are data centers where they've got, you know, the, the temperature controls and the security and things of that nature. Um, but they're still, you know, like anything subject to um, cyber terrorists and things like that. But um, but it's still ultimately it's, it's on-premise software. You still have to do your updates. Somebody still has to come in and update the software when there's a new version um, and that kind of thing. So it's just, um, it really isn't substantially different from um, an on-premises server, except that you typically have someone else who's maintaining this hardware for you and you don't have to do that yourself. So they're wrapping it in plastic when the hurricane comes yeah. instead of you. <laughs> well, it's, you know, typically the hosting centers will pick a, you know, an, a location like that where there's very low natural disaster, probably a lot <laughs> in Utah and whatnot. Um, not many in Florida, probably, but, um, but yeah, but, but with a, um, with a cloud-based software, um, that's typically not the case. Now there are some cloud-based softwares that are actually really just hosted on a large instance of AWS. And then there's also just true cloud software. So, um, you know, it's, it's all varying degrees, but um, typically with a cloud-based software, um, you, you're not responsible for even worrying about that server um, or even thinking about it. The upgrades can be pushed out automatically to you instead of you having to go say, okay, it's time for an upgrade. Let's go get all our decks in a row and, and upgrade the software. Yeah. And I think in my history, both as a contractor and as an executive here at a software company that sells cloud-based systems that used to do on-premise software, I can I can speak to the great cost savings of going to a cloud-based system where you're not paying for the labor to do those updates and the, the effort, the lags and the delays. The, I mean, just that cost alone is very expensive and, and something that I think contractors have primarily started letting go of that. Uh, I don't think that's the, I don't think that's the majority any longer, which is a good thing, but there are still some, like you said, that are still hanging onto their fax machines and still <laughs> love their paper. Uh, yeah, no, it can be, I, you know, the typical contractor does not have the technical expertise on staff to take care of all that. It is, and, and it's with, oh, I, can, I could go on all day about this with, with you know, um, security risks and, and things like that. It's just, I, I would never want to trust it to, you know, the, you know, the guy down the hall who's real good with computers. So you usually just go ask him when there's something wrong, you know, like that, you don't want that person in charge of your sensitive data and your operations being up and running. So, yeah, it's very critical data. And definitely, I think, uh, I think sometimes we forget, we get busy and our hair's on fire and we are just kind of used to doing things the way that we've always done them. And in construction, we're problem solvers and we're good at fixing things and, and uh, jerry rigging stuff to, you know, find, find a solution quickly. But uh, this is not an area to try and cut those corners on, for sure. Well, you don't think about it until you're lying in bed at night thinking, "Oh, did we? Do we even have a backup? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we might have one, but have we ever tested actually restoring it? 
know, yeah. and those yeah. things get alleviated. Or did the guy that knows how even still work here? I, I mean, I've, I've heard that a lot. You know, they lost the guy that knew. So. Yeah, well, and that's another point that, you know, I think we should talk about is losing the guy that knew. Because I think, you know, whether you've been on a software for a long time or you're new to a company that's using a software, I think it's so interesting that um, so many businesses only use just a fraction of what their ERP software can offer. Um, and the person who set it up did it for whatever your business conditions were at that time and maybe haven't evolved. I mean, maybe you didn't have a lot of people out in the field running all over the place. And so it wasn't a big deal at that time. But I think, you know, businesses just need to remember that they, they should be checking and saying, where do we have manual processes? Where do we have gaps in communication? And, and just saying, how can we fill these? Because chances are there's a solution. It may even already be in your software. It may be an add-on solution. Um, but, you know, always keep evolving with your software because I know the people that make the software are always evolving for you. And if you're not paying attention and you're just assuming that you can't do things, then, um, you know, you're missing out on a lot of the value you could be getting out of your software. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I was just last month, uh, it was very enjoyable. We were at a local AGC event. It was the 99th annual uh, Utah chapter um, AGC conference, and they did have it in person, so it was wonderful. And mm. in fact, they've got another event in a couple of days here, a safety conference that we're going to. So pretty excited about getting out there and uh, seeing people again a little bit. But uh, anyway, I was sitting down at dinner with a group that was telling me they they're still on the same software, but they started doing concrete work. Then they got into general contracting. Then they started doing paving. And now they focus on construction for mining. And so they're like, and oh, by the way, and cell phone towers and maintenance. So it's like their entire business has shifted multiple times. And now they're looking for a software that's more designed for the things that they're doing. And they've, they've tried to just navigate all of that with one ERP solution that probably is underserving them. So it's a great point you bring up that our business has changed and we should regularly look at those um, different tools that we're using to make sure we keep them sharp. So do you um, do you have any scenarios that, that you've heard of companies that maybe maybe for a specific reason they're not on the cloud or they can't be for one reason or another? Do you run into those scenarios? Yeah, it's usually when people like don't like to be efficient or save money or communicate well. That's usually the... <laughs> The type of person that's best served <laughs> steak. No, um, I would say that, that there are a couple examples where it's arguable that maybe it's not best to move to the cloud. But um, one being, you know, there's people who just there are businesses who are located in places where there is just not good Internet. Um, and that's okay. going to be a challenge no matter what you do. So, um, you know, there's tools out there uh, that can combat that for the field tools because a lot of tools, um, I believe yours will go ahead and work off a wireless connection or will collect the data and then sync back up when you're in range. So, you know, for that arguments, even going away a little bit, but if you've got a huge manufacturing plant in the middle of nowhere and you just don't have good internet, then, you know, that's one. Another one I would say is People who have a lot of HIPAA requirements tend to balk against um, having any kinds of cloud-based solutions because there's just a lot to, um, a lot of the products out there don't deal with that. I don't know that a lot of contractors have that problem. So um, those would really be the only cases where I've encountered people having legitimate reasons not to go to the cloud. Well, that's good. So that means everybody else uh, has has a an opportunity, I guess I'll, we'll say, to... Maybe look a little bit further so. if you haven't made the jump. I don't know. Have you seen any other reason, any other legitimate objections? I mean, I'm sure you've heard some, but I, mean, I hear I hear some companies say they do, you know, government work that's, you know, maybe yeah. for a certain reason, or or maybe a division or a department of their company that, uh, like you said, uh, different, different, very site specific, or or again where they physically are located. But yeah, nothing. I haven't heard too much that I don't think we could help solve with a cloud-based system, but people still think that on occasion that, you know, maybe it's not best for their business and, and, you know, maybe it's worth investigating that a little bit further with today's technology. So, so uh, in our pre-call, you had mentioned something about um, cloud-based systems being evergreen. What does that term mean? 
for the listeners? And is that something you can shed some light on? Um, well, so I don't know. There's a lot of um, moving parts in regulations and in forms and things of that nature that change very regularly. I mean, the best example I can give is is a great one, which is Avalero, which is a sales tax automation software that's cloud-based because mm -hmm. they have, you know, thousands and thousands of rule rate and boundary changes every year. Um, and they just push those out to the cloud. And um, so when you're a connected Avalara, you get the latest and greatest automatically because it's a cloud-based software. So um, all those types of things, any kind of compliance, um, it's much easier to keep on top of if you're not responsible for manually entering it into your system because you're connected to the cloud and it's going to automatically bring the latest compliance, um, whatever type of apparatus you're going to need, whether it's tax or payroll forms or things of that nature, automatically um, can save you a ton of time and also keep you out of um, being in non-compliance. Yeah, that's a great point. Actually, the OSHA or different safety regulations, especially with COVID, right? I mean, how many things are changing almost daily, weekly, monthly. I mean, there's there's been so many changes that everybody's been dealing with. And it, it would be nice to know that, that some institution or organization is on top of those things and that's their full-time job. And you can just continue building buildings and doing the things that you're used to doing and let them focus on. So with, uh, with somebody who's maybe on a legacy system today, a server-based client server, and they're looking to move to the cloud. What does what does that journey look like, or what kind of project do you think that they're in for to make that change? That's a there's a lot to that. Um, I, I would say that you know it's scary, right? Um, you know we have we have what we have. We don't want to lose what we have and our functionality. I mean, my advice would be definitely number one to talk to you know contractors talk to each other. You know, they're in the AGC, you're in the ABC, you're in the CFMA. You know talk to your peers and find out what they use, what shortcomings they found and that kind of thing to try to just, you know, make sure you're picking the right choice based on what they tell you, not based on, you know, what you read on the brochure from a software publisher, but um, what, what your peers are really saying. And then um, find a partner who specializes in construction and, it, you know, a, a software reseller typically, um, and you'll know, within a few minutes of talking to them, probably if, if they really understand construction or not, and it's very imperative that they understand construction. There's a lot of companies out there that understand ERP, um, but don't necessarily understand the intricacies of construction. So, um, you know, finding a partner, but that, you know, it doesn't have to be horribly painful. You know, you are going to probably have to make some decisions about how much data you want to convert and people get a little, a little scared about losing their historical data, but um, you know there are ways to mitigate that. Um, you know you get choices to make about how much you want to bring over and um, how much you still need to be able to access. And um, there's a lot of technology out there to to bring over the important data that you need. Um, so those are the things, and just you know think long term. You know you're what you're seeing with some of the legacy systems in general in ERP, and I'm not calling out any one particular, but the non cloud bases that. Um, you know, they're not investing a lot more in the future of these legacy products. And so um, if you want to keep being able to get the latest and greatest, like, and even a product. So, so if I'm a software publisher who makes an amazing business intelligence tool and it's the coolest technology and it's, mm -hmm. it's really awesome and everybody wants it, but um I'm going to look at your old legacy product and I'm going to go, mm, I'm not going to write an integration of that because that's dying off. And so you're mm -hmm. potentially cheating yourself out of a lot of cool new technology ahead of the game because people just aren't developing all this great new technology that's out there. There's AI, machine learning, all these things. Nobody wants to go build that for a product that's going away, <laughs> you know? So um, yeah. that's another consideration. Just start the move. Every journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. So talk to people, hear their stories and, you know, get with the 2020s. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess, obviously you would say because of what you're sharing that it's, it's well worth the move as soon as possible, not later. Right. I mean, that, <clears throat> that's what I've seen with adoption. I mean, honestly, I can't think I've ever heard of anyone say to me, Ugh, I wish we never moved to the cloud. Right. So, yeah, we did that here. We we moved our accounting and ERP from an on-premise. And I remember having to get backups to the accountants and 
yeah, I'll wait, hold on, don't do anything in this until we get the backup back from them. And I mean, it was just kind of a mess and you were in a holding pattern and you just can't do that these days. So uh, we are so thankful that we, I mean, I can be on my phone, you know, a thousand miles away looking at a report or a dashboard in the, in the accounting system. And Out in the woods, cool. running around. How's yeah. the accounting doing? <laughs> yep, trail running, <laughs> checking those reports. No question. <laughs> So, so uh, before we wrap up, I, I always like to ask a few more personal questions, but even before that, I, I know, I mean, you're a respected podcast host. I've enjoyed many of your episodes. You have awesome guests on and, and I've really enjoyed listening to your enterprise software podcast. Are there any guests or topics or stories or, or just something that really stuck out to you that you could share with our listeners that you learned or heard or, or you think that they might enjoy hearing? Oh, thank you for the compliments. That's very kind of you. Um, that's really hard because I, I, um, you know, I have so many favorites and, um, you know, one of my favorites is always a guy named Ed Kless. He's with Sage. Oh, yeah. Um, I yeah. And, you know, I'd be curious to know how applicable his topics are to, um, a construction company because he is very much against hourly billing. Now, I don't know that the construction industry could ever really get away. <laughs> from that, but he does a, um, his whole concept is value-based pricing. So you're basing your pricing on the value of the output, not on the actual cost of the inputs essentially. So his stuff's really good. I don't know how much of it you could adopt as a contractor, but, um, it's very thought provoking. Yeah. Well, and, and interesting too. I mean, they, the phrase, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, so to speak. Uh, those ideas are always fascinating for me to, to hear, because again, I am constructions in my bones. I, I think like a contractor still, sometimes I have to try and put on a technology hat and, you know, not look at things the way that I might have um, in order to be more effective in a technology space. But, uh, but I think there's a lot of contractors out there that want to be more innovative. They just don't quite know how. And so um, when you're busy and especially in a market that's just booming and crazy right now, it's, it's pretty hard to find extra time and bandwidth to go and try something new. Oh, agreed, one hundred percent. Another facet of what he talks about too is he's very passionate about subscription pricing for anything, um, and even just as a human being, as a consumer, you you can learn a lot from him about how you know he's basically saying everything's going to be in subscription, you know, very soon. And we're, you know, look at how much we've switched everything to subscription. Um, so that he's got some really interesting thoughts on that as well. So. Um, that helps maybe comfortable people feel more at ease with a subscription model that you typically have with cloud-based solutions is just understanding, look, you've subscribed to Netflix, you subscribe to, you know, whatever else you have, you've always had certain subscriptions and now it's more and more. So um, why not your software? Lower your operating expenses. I mean, I'm sorry, your capital expenses and um, shifts a little bit towards your operating expenses. So yeah, great advice. Well, so now that you uh, now that you've been on the, the podcast a little bit and we've had a little bit of dialogue, I want to ask you a few personal questions. So nothing crazy, but uh, so what what's one skill that you feel like you've kind of mastered or been able to really implement in your business life that, that you could share with others? Actually, I, I would say one of the biggest things that's had an impact on my business has been podcasting. Um, it has been such a great opportunity for me to meet people that I would probably have otherwise never had access to and learn from them and get their insights. And it's also really pushed me to keep up with the industry news that's important to my business, even though sometimes you're like, oh, I don't want to read that article. I don't have time to keep up with everything. Um, I'm like, oh, I got to do it because you might talk about it on the podcast. I need to talk to my listeners about this. So um, so that's been really valuable. And I encourage anyone to to look into it, um, to, to doing a podcast. It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun and can be very rewarding. Yeah, yeah I love that. You're, you have that always learning attitude and, I, and it, it shows you're very well versed on a lot of topics. I'm sure this is a big part of why. Thank you. What about, uh, <laughs> you bet. So what about your superpowers or something that's just <laughs> like, you know, when you're, when Darcy puts her cape on, what is that thing <laughs> that you're going after? <laughs> okay, well, I guess if we put my cape on, that's actually, <clears throat> it's when I put a badge on <laughs> oh, at bad. a conference. My <laughs> uh, my stupid human trick, I prefer to call it then a superpower because I feel like it's kind of, you know, 
<laughs> is um, is networking. I love networking. I love going to conferences and meeting new people and introducing people that can partner together and help each other out. Um, so it's just something that I have um, I really enjoy, and I am I humbly say I think I'm pretty good at. So um, that would be my stupid human trick superpower. I love it. I. I remember meeting you at a conference over 10 years ago and that wasn't by accident. So I'm sure, I'm <laughs> sure that there's many others that you were memorable for. So I agree. So what, uh, what's, what's one mistake that you've made kind of in your business career that you wish, you know, you would have learned earlier, I guess, maybe not a mistake, but something that you feel like you were able to overcome and improve that made an impact for you. Um, <clears throat> I think one thing I, learned is to um, be more willing to say no to things that aren't in my wheelhouse, um, which is not to say that you shouldn't try new things and branch out. Um, but what it tends to do in my experience and from what I've seen other people doing it as well is um, take you on a learning curve that distracts you from your core profitable assets of your fac facets of your business. So that's a lesson I have to learn to myself. Sometimes, mm -hmm. like, oh, I could get involved in that. That sounds cool. Oh, but wait, I do have all this other stuff I have to do that I've been meaning to do that actually is part of my core business. Stay there. It's okay. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not to say don't try new things, but just be aware is it worth going into? Is it going to help be healthy for your business in the long run to take something on? Oh, that's great. I love that. Super applicable to our, to our audience, of course. You know, do you take that job on that's totally not? what you do just because you can and it's there or, or do you kind of stay in your lane and focus on what you're already good at? All right. Well, the, so the last question. So if our listeners were to take away one thing from yours and my conversation today, what would you hope that would be for them? I would say to just keep in mind that cloud and mobile are not going anywhere. They're here to stay. So get into it. <laughs> Buckle up, buttercup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Well, thank you uh, very much. It's been a, a pleasure, Darcy. I've very much enjoyed catching up with you a little bit and having this conversation. I think our listeners will really enjoy this one. Well, thank you. It's so good to see you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We'll, we'll do it again down the road. Okay. And thank you for joining us on the Mobile Workforce Podcast today to the listeners sponsored by About Time Technologies and WorkMax. If you enjoyed Darcy and my conversation today or were able to learn some helpful tips or tricks or insights, please give us a five-star rating and review. And we would love you to also subscribe to the podcast. We appreciate you sharing this with your friends and colleagues. After all, our goal is to help you improve not only your business, but your life.